All right. Good morning, everyone. We'll get started here. Um, good morning. Uh, so today uh, I'm going to talk about the trans psoas approach to the lumbar spine, um, also known as the extreme lateral inner body fusion in some circles, hence the extreme spine surgery. Uh, so I have no disclosures. Um, so first, I'm just going to briefly touch on the history um, of what usually you tend to see in the literature as the history of this approach. Uh, we'll talk about the pertinent anatomy, as this is pretty important for this approach and understanding the anatomy pretty well. We'll talk about many of the indications and contraindications, which tend to be up to the surgeon who decides to use this approach. Uh, we'll talk about the risks and benefits of lateral lumbar antibody fusion. I'm going to go through kind of in detail the steps of how you actually do this approach in the procedure. And then throughout the talk, I'll bring up some uh, current literature articles. So um, usually speaking, most people talk about in 1998, uh, there was a Dr. Rosenthal in Frankfurt, Germany, uh, who was doing endoscopic thoracic lateral access approaches. In the top right-hand corner uh, is a gentleman, Luis Pimenta. In uh, 1997, Luis Pimenta was training uh, in Gainesville, uh, where he was doing a fellowship in spinal uh, endoscopic surgery. And then after that, in 1998, he underwent a fellowship with Dr. Daniel Rosenthal in Frankfurt, Germany, where then he ultimately returned to Brazil and started really working on developing the lateral approach. Um, in 2001, Luis Pimenta published on this in a paper um, and described the lateral trans psoas retroperitoneal approach for lumbar inner body fusion. A uh, similar paper was published in 2003 by Bertic Noli. And as these papers um, were being published, the Americans kind of caught on to this um, and started figuring out how to bring this to market, how to design products. Um, so they really started getting involved with designing the retractors, neuromonitoring, et cetera. And then ultimately in 2006, Dr. Osgur published a paper out of UC Irvine, really kind of talking about today what we call the XLIF. Uh, he did this in association with Luis Pimenta. Uh, so um, in that paper, they talk about, again, a lateral retroperitoneal transo as approach with the goal of being able to access the disc space anteriorly and be able to perform complete disectomies, distraction through the disc space and placement of inner body fusion. And the whole goal was that you could do this procedure without an approach surgeon compared to an anterior approach. Generally, most spine guys are using an approach surgeon with this technique. The goal is that you don't have to do that. And the reason why um, through this approach is that you can hopefully reduce the approach related morbidity associated with anterior approaches, primarily the risk of vascular injury. Um, and then the other reason as well, instead of going posterior, uh, the goal is you don't have to disrupt a lot of the posterior soft tissues that we do when we do direct decompressions. Uh, so some of the nomenclature, which I thought was confusing, especially when I was in medical school learning about this, um, what do all these acronyms mean? Um, the one you primarily hear of is the XLIF for extreme lateral inner body fusion. Um, this is more of a marketed name um, with a specific company, but you also may hear direct lateral or lateral lumbar inner body fusion. And again, this is the trans psoas retroperitoneal approach. Uh, another approach similar to this is the OLIF or oblique lateral interbody fusion. And then this approach is also retroperitoneal, but instead of being trans psoas, you go right around the front anterior to the psoas. And then a, a common one, which many people are familiar with, is the ALIF or the anterior lumbar interbody fusion. And this can be done either trans abdominally or more commonly uh, retroperitoneal. So why do this? Um, one, a lot of times when we talk about lateral approaches, the idea is through this phenomenon called indirect decompression. Uh, we don't have to go directly through the posterior elements to try and decompress the spine. We can do this by an indirect means uh, through the front and increase foraminal openings in the central, disp or the central canal space. Uh, again, um, instead of going posteriorly, this approach uh, causes less tissue trauma and less wound issues. Uh, this has been shown um, in different studies as well. The idea here, since you're not going through the front or the back, you avoid disruption of the posterior and anterior longitudinal ligaments, ultimately leading to maybe a more stable construct. Um, many studies published kind of 
perioperative outcomes showing less uh, EBL, shorter OR times, as well as shorter hospital stays in comparison to uh, posterior fusions. Going through the side, um, kind of similar to the front, you're also able to place a larger cage. And in doing so, um, you can argue that you can have increased lordosis and increased disc height, which you may not be able to achieve through a posterior approach. Um, as well, there's some articles that talk about maybe there's less subsidence than doing um, transferaminal lumbar interbody fusions. Again, the idea here is that it's a more biomechanically stable construct. You're able to put in a larger cage with a larger footprint, and especially with a lateral approach, you can get these cages um, over top of the peripheral cortical bone, which is going to be stronger than your inner end plates where gen generally your T-lift cage sits. Um, also, um, this is a described uh, technique for correction of many different adult spinal deformities, reduction of spondees, coronal deformities, and sagittal deformities. Uh, so here's a kind of a cross section, which I thought was interesting to kind of demonstrate the different sizes and cages, which you can place through each approach. You see there in the green, that's the transferaminal cages, which are much smaller than generally we're able to place with an A-lift cage or an X-lift cage. Um, ultimately the X-lift cage does have the biggest cross-sectional surface area uh, overlying that end plate. So like most things in life, does bigger, does bigger, better, does size really matter? Um, so a couple of studies kind of look at this and describe the cross-sectional area of the end plates as being an important factor for inner body grafts and inner body fusions, because ultimately you're increasing the surface area for which fusion can occur. You're able to get greater disectomies and end plate preps than you can do uh, more commonly through a posterior approach. And through this, again, you can get larger cages, larger correction, um, and ideally uh, less risk of subsidence. Um, a study in 2014 uh, looked at actually a cadaveric study looking at disc space preps versus X lift versus A lift. They actually found that X lifts have better disc space preparation at three, four, and two, three versus an A lift. Um, but overall, A lifts and X lifts have superior end plate preparation as compared to posterior um, fusions because obviously you don't have to retract the dura and you have a greater access to disc space. So some more arguments for kind of why to do this. Um, posteriorly, you're going to encounter the dura. You're not going to encounter the dura during this approach. So ideally, you should not be exposing any fecal sac or nerve roots. So the risk of CSF leak is basically negligible. Uh, lower rates of sympathetic dysfunction, doing anterior approaches. In the literature, it's been described that um, this is as high as anywhere from 9 to 43%. The lateral approach reduces that risk, which you would be subjected to anteriorly. Again, another reason um, you don't have to mobilize the great vessels through this approach. Um, the literature says that anywhere from 0 to 18% of vascular complications uh, with the A-lift, most commonly at L4-5, either at or right below the bifurcation of the vessels. And most commonly, the complications you tend to see are either DVTs or uh, vessel retraction injuries. As you retract the vessels away, you can get these kind of shearing tears. Uh, so some people actually talk about ligating the iliac lumbar vein prophylactically, especially if you're going anterior to try and decrease that risk. And then um, a significant, although low risk with anterior approach is the risk of retrograde ejaculation. Uh, it's primarily a contraindication in younger males. So uh, this was another technique described that you can still go through kind of a somewhat anterior approach with reducing that risk uh, and a patient population that may be at risk. So I thought this was kind of a good slide to show exactly what indirect decompression is and what we had try to achieve. Uh, so here you can see kind of a lumbar anterolisthesis um, with foraminal uh, narrowing as well as disc space collapse. And then after placement of the cage, you kind of see somewhat a decent reduction of that spondylolisthesis as well as the increase in disc height and foraminal opening. So um, indirect decompression, what does the literature show? Uh, Kepler published a study that through uh, X lifts, uh, they noted that they could increase the foraminal area up to 35%. Uh, study in 2007, um, kind of at the forefront of when the lateral approach was getting started, they looked at uh, foraminal height increases in the A lift versus the T lift. Overall, the A lift showed about a 2.7 millimeter increase versus a T lift was actually slightly negative in their averages. And then in 2014, in kind of a comparison study, um, X lifts at a 
145 patients found an average pyramidal height increase of 2.5, which was similar to what was being achieved through the anterior approach. And again, um, kind of one of the ways that this happens is because you're preserving the ALL and PLL, uh, when you put in that cage, you can kind of get a reduction of the vertebral bodies through ligament ataxis, which ultimately can help lead to the decrease in central stenosis. So uh, some of the people um, out there think that central stenosis is a contraindication uh, to lateral interbody fusions and indirect decompression. Uh, so here was actually a recent study published in the journal Neurosurgery in 2020, looking at central stenosis um, and kind of what happened pre-op and post-op when doing an X-lift. Uh, so this was a retrospective case series from one institution. They looked at 42 patients with severe degenerative lumbar stenosis, uh, wasn't just mild or, or uh, moderate, and they did pre-op and post-operative MRIs. Uh, ultimately, these patients either had L3 or um, 4 or 5, or sorry, 3, 4 or 4 or 5 uh, levels operated on, and all these patients underwent uh, posterior fixation without de direct decompression. Um, and so the main thing they looked at was a cross-sectional area, the thecal sac. Um, Preoperatively, they averaged about 55 millimeters, and then at last follow-up, um, that almost uh, tripled to 132 millimeters. Um, the other thing they noted was their fusion rates at one year were 89%, which is pretty good. And then overall, the disc height increased from 6.3 to 9.6 millimeters. So this study kind of did demonstrate really that you can get pretty good indirect decompression with um, central stenosis. Here is uh, kind of an MRI that they showed from their study, which I thought depicted that pretty well. You can see there on the pre-op films, there's an anterolisthesis as well as significant central stenosis. And then three weeks post-op and last follow-up, you can see a pretty significant uh, correction of that spondylolisthesis as well as um, decompression of that central stenosis. Uh, so another thing um, to talk about is segmental lordosis. So usually, you know, people that do deformity think, you know, going through the front is obviously considered superior because you can do an ALL resection. You can release that anterior longitudinal ligament and then put in a pretty big cage to try and get a decent lordotic correction. Um, overall, a study in 2014 looking at this, they found that on average per level, a list gets you about 4.5 degrees versus x lifts gets you 2.2 degrees, so slightly less. Um, a couple of other studies looking at just x lifts um, they averaged anywhere from 2.4 to 2.9 degrees of segmental lordotic correction. Um, and then the study uh, in 2013 just showed that most significant improvement in lordosis was at the four or five levels, which um, most commonly is near the apices of the lumbar curve. Uh, and then lastly, there was a direct comparison in 2014 um, and spine that looked at ALIF, ALIF versus XLIF, and again, kind of redemonstrated that you can get a little bit better uh, segmental lordosis correction with an anterior cage uh, versus a lateral cage. But, you know, two degrees, is that, is that a lot? Does that matter? Um, a couple of studies kind of pushed the envelope to see what more we could do. So Uribe published in 2014, once we started developing hyperlordotic cages and expandable cages, obviously we could try to achieve more correction. So he used um, hyperlordotic cages of 20 and 30 degrees in combination with an ALL release through the lateral approach and found that he could improve on average seven and 11 degrees of segmental lordosis uh, respectively to those cages. In 2012, another series of seven patients, again, with hyperlordotic cage, they found that with an ALL release, they could achieve up to 17 degrees of lordosis. And then in 2014, um, another paper found actually up to 23s of lordotic correction. Uh, there is some confounders in this paper, though, where uh, some of these patients ultimately did end up going uh, posterior osteotomies to try and increase their lordosis. So um, kind of a conclusion in regards to that, I would say on average, it seems most of the papers are showing you can get plus or minus two degrees of segmental lordosis correction through the lateral approach and um, mostly these um, fixed cages. If you start to get into the realm of expandables and hyperlordotics, including an AL, ALL release, and then if you really want to do a, some sort of posterior osteotomy, you can get pretty significant correction up to 20 degrees at, a, at each level. Um, the goal here is, again, this gives you another option instead of going front back that you can do this through a lateral and posterior approach instead. Um, 
And again, although a lifts is usually considered the gold standard for kind of getting in that big cage for correction, you can still get pretty significant correction through a lateral approach. Uh, so what are some of the indications? Um, they're kind of everywhere. Um, the more you start looking, generally speaking, in the lumbar spine, uh, you have access to the L1 to L5 disc spaces. You're generally blocked by the 12th rib and the iliac crest. At uh, 5.1, your iliac crest is usually too high for your lateral access. So that's a level that you're most likely going to have to do an anterior approach. And then, like I've talked about, you can use this in deformity. Um, another indication people will do this for is if they've had previous posterior surgery where the dura has been exposed or a previous dural leak. This is another option where you don't have to go into the back and have that risk of another dural tear. Um, and then... Again, here's just a bunch of different papers showing all different types of indications. Um, you can find an indication for almost anything if you really look hard enough. Uh, I thought an interesting one, <clears throat> I don't think there's any products on the market, but people have looked into and they may still be trying to do total disc replacements from the lateral approach. Um, so what are some of the contraindications? Again, um, Pathology at 5.1, you're going to be blocked by the iliac crest, as well as the lumbar plexus courses more anteriorly at this level. Uh, even some patients with that Mickey Mouse pelvis can even be blocked at 4.5. Uh, so you need to look at your, your pre-op films and study those. Um, another thing that can be a contraindication is some people are doing standalone cages. You need to be careful when doing those, especially if it's at a level of high biomechanical stress, patients that are osteoporotic. Um, and again, at a level where they have some sort of fusion above or below, maybe it's um, an idiopathic fusion, as well as if it's a high grade spondy, then they're going to be somewhat unstable. So standard cage is probably your, not your best choice. Um, things you need to talk to your patients about preoperatively, have they had any sort of retroperitoneal surgery in the past? Have they ever had any sort of retroperitoneal trauma or infection? Uh, that may be something that may steer you away from this. Uh, you need to really look at their vascular anatomy, make sure they don't have any aberrant vessels, uh, look at the psoas musculature, large psoas um, may sometimes preclude you from being able to get to that safe access point. Uh, patients with significant stenosis, a lot of people still think this is a contraindication, especially if you have facet hypertrophy or significant ligamentum hypertrophy, because ultimately even through in indirect decompression, you're not going to be able to decrease the size of the facets and that significant um, ligamentum hy hypertrophy. Uh, the MRI up in the top right-hand corner uh, is what we would call kind of an anterior psoas. This can also be a general uh, contraindication as it places you at a higher risk for femoral nerve injuries intraoperatively. So you'll see that the psoas muscle kind of rises away from the vertebral body, vertebral body eventually and laterally, uh, and it congruently kind of stretches the lumbar plexus, so it puts it at a little bit greater risk um, when you start to see that on your MRI. Another contraindication sometimes can be osteoporosis, especially um, through the lateral approach, depending upon what you're doing with your cage, previous abdominal surgery, and then any sort of, again, idiopathic fusion or locked facets in the back, you're not going to be able to achieve a correction through the front um, if you have that kind of posterior fusion back there. So preoperative planning um, is very essential for this procedure. You need to really study your films. You want to look at the psoas size and location. You want to see where your great vessels are um, or any other aberrant anatomy near your approach. Rib positioning. Um, so at your superior levels, in general, you're going to run into that 12th rib. If that's a problem, sometimes you can do an intercostal approach or you can resect the rib to achieve your uh, access to that disc space. Um, height of the iliac crest we talked about, but just make sure to look on your films to try and see your trajectory if that's going to be a problem for you. Um, they actually now have some angled inserters for these levels to improve your access um, if you can't go directly, um, so you can kind of go at an angled approach. Um, scoliosis, just something to keep in mind. If you are going lateral uh, in the concavity, you're going to obviously have a much deeper working distance um, down to the spine. Um, one caveat is you can do this if you're doing multiple levels on a concavity, you may be able to reach them all through one incision uh, versus a convexity. You're going to approach your anatomy pretty quick um, as it's going to be much closer to you uh, on your approach. And then another thing to keep in mind is that the lumbar plexus generally runs more anterior on a concavity.
Um, if you are going above kind of L2 to L1, um, then you may start getting into a transdiaphragmatic approach. Um, so if that's something you're not comfortable with, you may need to get thoracic surgery involved. Positioning is pretty important. Um, so in general, this started out as a lateral decubitus position. Um, you basically put the hip over a break point of the table. You want to make sure there's padding underneath the perineal nerve. The top leg should be flexed at the knee and the hip so that you can relax that psoas and take uh, tension off of it. And then ultimately you place your ax roll and then a pillow between the knees. Um, so there's studies out there. Originally, people started talking about breaking the bed to try and increase the working space between the ribs and the crest. Uh, you need to be careful doing this because you can cause traction neuropraxias from prolonged traction. There are some people that are actually going away from this altogether and doing no break in the bed. Um, next thing too, which I put on there is position of the C-arm. So basically you wanna position the patient um, so that you can obtain a true AP and lateral fluoroscopic image, which you're gonna be using basically throughout the entire case. Um, so once you have the patient positioned, you're gonna rotate the bed so that direct lateral is zero degrees on the C-arm. And that way you're gonna be operating directly perpendicular to the floor. Um, the reason for this is it's gonna help you increase your safety by not having to change your trajectory. You can always basically aim straight down to the floor when accessing your disc space. Obviously, you know, because if you start to go into anterior, you have the great vessels. If you go posterior, then you can end up um, in the contralateral side neural foramen. Um, Another tip when performing at multiple levels, make sure you readjust the rotation of the bed at each level um, to again, achieve that perfect lateral. And then most importantly, make sure the patient's taped down well so there's no movement during the case that can throw you off. I'm not gonna go into great detail, but there's been the new um, discussion uh, where people are now doing prone laterals. Um, so they're doing the lateral approach through a prone positioning. Um, and kind of the reason for this is if you wanna do posterior instrumentation, if you're doing a lateral approach, a lot of times you're going to have to reprep and redrape and reposition the patient to then go posterior to put in your pedicle screws. There are some patients that are some people that are doing uh, pedicle screw placement in the lateral position. Um, I, have, I have not seen it, but it sounds somewhat difficult. And it seems like a lot of times if they're doing that, they're doing it under navigation. Uh, but through this approach, um, you can do kind of both your posterior and lateral access all in one position. As well, some people argue you can get better lordotic correction through this just by uh, the positioning of the patient on the table. So what are the radiographic views you're going to look for? Um, here, basically a, a somewhat perfect AP and lateral of the lumbar spine. On the lateral, you want to make sure your end plates are pretty cleaned up and overlying each other. Your pedicle should be superimposed so that you only see one pedicle. And then on the AP, you want your spinous processes at each level midline. And then you should basically be able to draw a transverse section through the pedicles um, straight across and that they should be equal bilaterally. Um, there, I, I put up a picture of kind of some different skin markings that people have done. Uh, the top one, I'd see, I've not really seen anyone do, which is basically drawing out your vertebral bodies under x-ray. The bottom ones are different types of incision finders, which I'll go through one of those next, uh, but that can just help you kind of localize your disc space for where you're gonna make your incision. Uh, this is the uh, finder that I have seen and used. Um, basically, it's a cross and you lay it uh, on the patient in a lateral position and you're going to draw out your anterior and posterior borders of your vertebral body. And then you want to place that X basically between the anterior two thirds and the posterior one third of that disc space. Um, after doing this, then you're going to make a skin incision that's generally only about 2.5 to 3 centimeters in length, and you're going to localize it directly over the disc space. A uh, single incision can be used for multiple levels. If you're doing multiple levels, you can cheat it up or down more towards the midpoint between the levels if needed. And again, that ideal target, generally speaking, which I'll go into further, is the um, between the anterior two-thirds and the posterior one-third of that uh, disc space. So the approach, um, a lot of pe a lot of people now are doing this more through kind of like a minimally invasive blunt feel technique. You can do it through an, like a true open or a mini open if you want to. Uh, but generally speaking, you're going to do blunt dissection down through um, your abdominal musculature. This is going to be a muscle splitting technique. You're going to encounter your external oblique, your internal oblique, and then your transverse abdominus muscles. And then you're going to split them along their uh, respective fibers. 
once you go through this, you're ultimately going to be um, into the retroperitoneal space. Once entering, you're under direct visualization. If you're doing open or through blunt feel, you're going to do gentle sweeping motions with your finger to release adhesions between the peritoneum anteriorly and the psoas and abdominal wall. And then ultimately, you're going to be able to palpate the psoas lateral to the vertebral body. Um, and then you can kind of verify your positioning and disk space from there. Um, the psoas fibers generally are split along the direction of their axis. And then ultimately, after that, you'll be down to the underlying disk space. Uh, once you get to that disk space, uh, then you're ultimately going to take, uh, it's kind of like a trocar, um, and you're going to verify your start point with that going through the psoas. Um, if a different level must be operated on, a new dissection of the psoas should be performed. Um, so make sure you take your retractors all the way out. You don't slide them up or down throughout the psoas. And then ultimately, as well as you can see kind of with the anatomy, depending upon how uh, superior or inferior are, uh, you have some of those retroperitoneal structures like the kidney um, that you may be feeling on your approach. Uh, so neuromonitoring is pretty important. Um, so over here on the left as a lateral and AP of the lumbar spine, and this is kind of the initial dilator that you're going to place. And again, you want to position between that kind of anterior two thirds and posterior one third, and you want it directly perpendicular with your disc space in the floor, um, kind of directly down to that. Um, a lot of, or over the years, a lot of people have developed kind of trying or try to develop safer techniques to doing this approach. So a lot of these now are neuromonitoring probes. So as you're going through the psoas, you can actually turn it 360 degrees and obtain different neuromonitoring values to have an idea how close or far away you are um, from the nerves. So once you get that down there and you feel it's in a safe position, you're ultimately going to hit it into the disc space. And then over that, um, you'll start doing serial dilations for then which you'll be able to place your retractors. Um, again, neuromonitoring is important. Um, you should probably be doing, you know, your transcranials, your SSEPs and stuff like that, but ultimately it's going to be up to the surgeon on what they want to do. Another thing to consider is monitoring the saphenous nerve um, to try and detect femoral uh, traction injuries while doing your surgery. So here's a picture. Um, once you place those serial dilators, uh, that retractor goes down over it and you're going to uh, reach the disc space. Once you feel it is in appropriate position, there is a posterior uh, shim that kind of goes down along and then wedges into uh, the disc space to hold your retractors in place. And then you're slowly going to open up kind of those retractors to an appropriate position to allow you to visualize the disc space. And again, through every step in this, <clears throat> through dilation and placement of your uh, retractors, as well as once you start to open your retractors, um, keep watching your uh, neuromonitoring to evaluate for the nerves. Uh, so once you're down, um, here's kind of a step-by-step -step progression through the case. Uh, you're gonna start with an annulotomy with a 10 blade, um, followed by a disectomy. And you can use your pituitary rongeur or whatever tool you like best to remove the disc material. And then through some gentle distraction, you can uh, put your cob in there. You're going to get to your clean end plates. And then ultimately, it's important as well. You want to go through the contralateral side and release a contralateral annulus carefully all the way across the, the disc space. Um, so once you have your good end plate prep, all the end plate cartilage is off, you can start trialing, um, which is what you see in the kind of bottom pictures. And then ultimately, you'll be able to trial and place your implant. Uh, after um, implant insertion, um, double check your position on your AP and lateral. And then ultimately, this is an important part too, is you want to have good fascial closure to try and prevent any sort of post-op hernias at the surgical site since you are going through that abdominal musculature. If this does happen, then um, you may want to get some general surgery colleagues involved. So um, talking about the lumbar anatomy here, um, kind of going back through the approach and what's important. Uh, we'll spend a decent amount of time just kind of going through this because it's it's important to knowing what's going on when you're going down. Um, so the lumbar plexus, complex neural network uh, formed by the ventral branches of the first to the fourth upper lumbar nerves. It has seven major branches that pass through the psoas major and ultimately run obliquely down through the pelvis. <coughs> Sorry, the intrapsoas part of the plexus uh, is, is, is what is at risk during a trans-psoas approach. 
the last thoracic nerve or T12 usually supplements the first lumbar nerve in which forms the iliohypogastric nerve, which you see there, as well as the ilioinguinal nerve. Uh, these are important on your superficial dissection and they su supply sensation to the buttock and um, hypogastric regions and the ilioinguinal nerve supplies sensation to the groin and external genitalia. These two sensory branches can be commonly injured during the blunt dissection of the oblique muscles. Generally, that's why we do blunt dissection and we do not use bovi uh, once we go through the skin during this approach. Um, L2, 3, and 4 form the LFCN and obviously supply sensation over the lateral thigh as well as the femoral nerve and obturator nerve at these levels. Um, the femoral nerve supplying hip flexors and knee extensors while the obturator supplies the adductors of the leg. And then these branches are more at risk during the dissection of the psoas. Um, this can occur, injuries can occur via either direct trauma or indirect trauma by retraction um, causing ischemia. And it's a, a side effect that we'll talk about too kind of throughout the rest of this presentation. But um, special attention should be a paid to the genital femoral nerve. This is the only nerve that is going to be anterior uh, to where you're going to dock your um, trocar. Um, and it's formed by the union of the axons of L1 and 2 and supplies sensation to the upper anterior thigh as well as the anterior scrotum in males and the mons pubis in females. Uh, so it's really the only ventral nerve. So just be aware where that is. So there is a danger um, anteriorly to where you'll be as well. And then um, you can kind of see there, I thought those were some of the better anatomy pictures really showing you this is somewhat of a danger zone if you stray too far from where you need to be. Um, again, pre-op imaging, when looking at your psoas, so you'll see here, I talk about you want to be kind of at that anterior two-thirds of the posterior one-third of that disc space. Um, this changes as you go inferior and move down in the lower lumbar spine. Um, and I show you kind of a cross section here at each level to, so that you can really see that as you go inferior, the psoas starts to move anteriorly which is part of the reason why you're gonna slightly change your start points. Um, so there was a study in 2010 that Uribe published and it was a cadaveric study, uh, which kind of helps us see where we should go with this. So the safe working zones for the trans psoas approach, um, you basically divide the vertebral body into four quartiles in the sagittal plane. And then through this, we can kind of see here what I talked about for your start point, generally speaking, you're going to be in zone two for your two, three, and three, four disc spaces. And as you go more inferior, you're going to start to cheat that a little more anterior. And that's because the lumbar plexus starts to move anterior. Um, and so you're going to be at a slightly increased risk as you go inferior uh, of damaging any sort of nerves. Um, the other thing to consider again as your um, great vessels down there. Generally speaking, they shouldn't be too involved with this approach. Um, it's more concerned with the anterior approach. Um, as well, when you're in the lateral decubitus position, the aorta and the IVC tend to fall more anterior to the surgical corridor in this position, which increases your safe zone um, as well. That's why generally speaking through a lateral approach, vascular injuries are almost none to very rare. Uh, you just, again, need to be careful of your retractor placement and make sure during your disc space prep, et cetera, that you're not migrating too far anteriorly. And then again, kind of retroperitoneal structures to be mindful of. Um, you're going to be working near the kidney, the ureters, and the adrenal glands. Um, and again, just another anatomy depiction of kind of showing you where those are um, because those are technically at risk during this approach. Um, it's a very low risk that any of these are generally injured. So now you placed your cage, everything's done, great, now what? So after all that, did you even get a fusion? So looking at fusion rates through the lateral approach, generally speaking, um, they're all very similar to both the anterior and posterior approach cages. Uh, 2015, a, a study of 77 patients found a 98% fusion rate, which was extremely high. Um, I listed kind of the uh, bone graft substitutes as well as uh, whatever they placed in a cage in these studies, um, just for your info. But overall, the fusion rates with the lateral approach is pretty similar. One study showed 93%, and then another study showed 85%. So um, some of the things, too. So once you place your cage, do you need to have additional augments? 
Um, there are screws that can be inserted through the cage. There are plates that you can also add additionally around the cage and that you place screws into the vertebral body, as well as whether or not you want to add posterior fixation to supplement the construct. Um, there are people that are doing standalone cages. Um, people have different indications for who those people are. Generally speaking, uh, I would say it seems like the patients that may benefit and be okay with a standalone cage are young patients, good bone stock, and minor deformity. Um, some studies have published on revision rates of standalone cages and found anywhere from three and a half to 13 and a half percent. Obviously, this is going to be patient dependent on who's uh, included in these studies. But overall, these studies found that failure is generally associated with significant deformity, uh, greater than a grade one spondylolisthesis, osteoporosis. Um, and what happens is generally these patients end up getting graft subsidence, loss of decompression, and then ultimately that indirect decompression um, fails. So then generally you have to go posterior. So, you know, if you have any concern at all, um, you might as well just add some sort of, you can do percutaneous pedicle screws or some sort of posterior support to increase the stability of your construct. Um, interestingly too, um, the flip side, uh, there was some things I read from Luis Pimenta and Juan Uribe. So overall, they generally put posterior fixation in almost all their patients. They say at this point in their career for the 20, 30 years they've been doing it, less than 10% of the patients get standalone cages. Um, but they said one of the patients they consider them in is patients that are high risk, anticoagulated, you don't want to go posterior, et cetera. This is an additional option that you can get in and out relatively quickly with low blood loss um, as an alternative. So um, how do we increase effectiveness of standalone cages? Um, use as wide of a footprint as you can to get that good cortical um, surface contact as well as a peripheral cortical bone. You don't want to overstuff the disc space. Um, make sure you're respecting your end plates when you're doing your disc space prep, all general things that we always talk about. Uh, one of the side effects here, which I found interesting, um, so using these cages uh, with the plate and screw construct, uh, you basically put a screw above and below the level you're operating on, and then you can get these actual coronal plane fractures, which have been described in the literature. Um, Juan Uribe talks about this. He actually no longer uses this anymore. And he said industry tends to push these on a lot of surgeons because they say, oh, it increases your construct stability and stuff like that. It's an additional CPT code, uh, but it is a risk with this plate. And so a lot of people have actually started to go away from this. Um, and the idea of how this fails is one of two things. One, you are putting screws directly above and below that cage. So you're in increasing the stress concentration kind of right at that area of the end plate. And then two, if you get any sort of graph subsidence, these are basically a fixed angle construct. So that's going to basically saw through your uh, vertebral bodies if it migrates. So overall, what do the outcomes look like? Generally speaking, um, across most of the literature, patients have improved, you know, ODIs, patient reported outcomes, et cetera. Uh, when looking at deformity cases, um, this one study showed that they had an average coronal deformity correction of 25 down to 13 and a half degrees. And then overall, it seems like most patients have comparable satisfaction rates through the lateral approach. Um, so what are the downsides? Uh, one, which is, again, a lot of these risk factors you need to bring up to the patient, especially transient <clears throat> hip flexor weakness, since you are violating the so as to this approach, it's very common that you're going to have hip flexor weak, weakness post-op. And as you go more inferior, generally you think this rate may increase based on the course of the plexus. Overall, though, patients should know that uh, most all this resolves by six months. And generally it's thought to be due to either edema, hematoma during your surgical exposure, muscle trauma, or stretch from the retractors. And some ways to try and hopefully decrease this is one, when you place your probe doing your intramuscular dissection, you have that neuro monitoring to try and um, evaluate where your probe is in relation to the nerves. Uh, you want to place your retractors at the appropriate position for the level, which I talked about, um, kind of where, what level you're at, depending upon where the psoas is. And then ultimately, you want to limit your retraction time to less than 30 minutes per level, which I'll touch on on the next slide. Um, ultimately, um, there are 
permanent motor complications that can't happen from this approach. Um, a meta-analysis in 2015 found on average, most studies saying anywhere from 2.9 to 4.6%. Uh, these are generally related to retraction, tri retraction time greater than 30 minutes. It's much less frequent that um, patients developed a direct nerve injury through this approach. And overall, a 12-month follow-up, um, they found across all studies, on average, 2.9% of patients experienced persistent motor deficits, most commonly uh, quad weakness. Um, end plate fracture can happen as well as these are very, very rare, but you are going to be retroperitoneal. So things like urologic injury, bowel injury, et cetera, um, are considered a risk through this approach. And then another thing to discuss is pseudo hernias. Um, very rare, but it can happen. Um, and usually this is basically traction on the ilioinguinal or iliohypogastric nerves or nerves innervating your kind of abdominal musculature. Generally speaking, this tends to be transient, although it can happen. Um, nerve tractor, retractor timing and placement, you know, as this was developed, we realized the importance of this as trying to minimize risks um, associated with this approach. So generally speaking, you want to limit your retractor timing from for, for about 20 to 30 minutes. Um, so you can start a time in the room, et cetera. So you kind of have an idea how long you've been in there when you're doing this. Uh, 20 15 study looked at this um, and they found that in this paper, retraction time less than 20 minutes, there was zero lumbar plexopathies. And again, advocated for retraction time less than 20 to 30 minutes. Uribe published uh, his study in 2015 looking at this and he looked at over 300 patients uh, undergoing surgery at four or five. Again, 31% had IP weakness, 13% had sensory dysfunction and 4.5% had motor dysfunction, most commonly the quad. He looked at different variables in regards to retractor placement, timing, um, neuromonitoring, et cetera. He really found no difference <clears throat> in regards to the initial posterior blade reading. So once you put your blades down and you open your retractors, there was really no correlation in what the neuromonitoring was reading with uh, the eventual outcome of having any sort of neurologic side effect. The biggest thing, again, he also noticed, which reinforces the idea of retractor timing, is a positive relationship between symptomatic neuropraxy and total retraction time. And in his study, on average, patients that experienced symptomatic neuropraxia had a retraction time of over 32 minutes versus 22.6 minutes. Um, and again, you want to retract that nerve from anterior to posterior. You never want to retract it from posterior to anterior. And another thing, um, a lot of times we have a habit of opening retractors bigger um, you only want to open them as, as much as you need to really kind of identify that disc space to do your work. Uh, the anterior thigh sensory deficit um, is somewhat common. Uh, up to 40% of the patients in one of the studies uh, had this post-op, but basically it continually always resolves at around two weeks, and it's just kind of a retraction neuropraxia. Um, I talked about, again, the iliohypogastric and ilioinguinal nerves. When you're doing your superficial dissection, you don't want to use bovi. You want to use blunt dissection. Uh, autonomic injuries for this approach are generally pretty rare. And that's one of the pros for this approach versus anterior approach. Um, so things like dysfunction of the viscera or uh, sexual organs that you're more concerned about with an anterior approach are gonna be pretty limited through this. And then vascular injuries, there are documented reports of this. Obviously, if you um, start to migrate too anteriorly with your instruments, but overall there was a study there um, by Rogers that showed out of 600 patients, there was no vascular, no visceral injuries. Long-term risks, um, the feared complication long-term is implant subsidence and loss of your indirect decompression. You can get lateral migration of the cages, which can cause leg pain if they start to uh, migrate towards the neural frame and it cause exiting nerve root impingement. Um, a study by Lee looked at uh, subsidence rates. He found overall radiographic subsidence in his cohort was about 14% although only 2% of these any had any sort of clinical um, outcome with their subsidence. So overall, even if you do get some subsidence, uh, most patients didn't have any sort of clinical problem with that. Um, and again, some of the tips to try and decrease this, avoid over distraction of the disc space, protect your end plates. And then some studies and people talk about getting DEXA scans on these patients preoperatively and trying to treat them or tee them up a little bit uh, before you do their surgery. And then another risk, obviously, is pseudoarthrosis if you don't get um, a good fusion. So obviously, with this approach, a lot of people were concerned with the risk of nerve injuries and stuff like that. So they said, instead of going through the psoas, why not go through the front? 
Um, so that's when the OLIF was developed and people that are more advocates of that um, basically say you don't have to worry as much about that neurologic risk just going around the front of the psoas. So a 2019 study published in the journal Neurosurgery by Uribe and a bunch of his residents at the Barrow Institute, they did a systematic review and meta-analysis comparing the XLIF versus the OLIF approaches in overall um, had pretty similar rates of complications, although the complications which they had slightly differed. The OLIF obviously had higher rates of vascular complications and trade-off for higher rates of neurologic complications with the XLIF. And I highlighted here kind of those differences between the two approaches. Um, the XLIF had higher levels of transient thigh pain and numbness at 21% and 19% transient IP weakness, which is kind of somewhat similar to the other uh, numbers I've shown. Permanent motor deficits across this was 2.8% in the XLIF group, which was similar to what I presented before. But the OLIF group is not without its own complications. It still had a 1% permanent motor deficit through this approach, even though you're going anterior to the psoas. Uh, there were zero sympathetic plexus injuries in the XLIF group versus as you start going more anteriorly, you're going to be closer to that plexus. So uh, the OLIF actually had 5.4%. And then looking at the vascular injuries, OLIF had 1.8% in comparison to 04 in the XLIF. So overall, similar complication rates. It's kind of up to you as a surgeon what you feel more comfortable with, and it's a trade-off between whether or not you want to deal with a, a higher vascular complication rate versus maybe more of a transient neuropraxia. Uh, so in conclusion, um, <clears throat> you are limited generally at the 5-1 disc space. Um, generally, L1 through L4 are your more um, utilized levels. Um, as you start to go inferiorly, the idea is that your lumbar plexus is going to be more anteriorly, so you may have an increased neurologic risk, um, most significantly in 4-5. Um, with the understanding of anatomy and retraction time, our use of neuromonitoring, hopefully we kind of continue to decrease our risks um, over time. Um, and it's important to advise these patients preoperatively, if you're going to do this approach, that they should be aware that it's likely once they come out of surgery, they're going to have probably thigh numbness and hip flexor weakness. But generally speaking, this usually resolves. Um, this is a good approach that kind of respects the soft tissues instead of going in the back. Um, and it's a, obviously a quicker procedure um, for those that do it, you know, more often and be able to fit, you know, bigger cages, bigger footprints in. Um, I think it's, you know, a good approach for the right patients with the correct pathology. Um, if you have significant facet hypertrophy or ligamentum hypertrophy, you'd be concerned that if you're just going from the front, you may not be able to obtain the sort of decompression that you're going to be able to achieve through the back. Um, so while no, there's no ideal technique for every case and every patient, you know, obviously evaluating the clinical presentation, radiographic pathology and the anatomy, um, I think there's patients that, you know, may be appropriate for this technique. Um, and then I will include our celebrity in the stands here, um, who gave me a call. Um, so Dr. Malberg was doing this back when it began to start and, uh, wrote a chapter on the uh, lateral approach. So nice to hear from you about this. I wasn't able to, um, get access to the book, but I found your name crawling around some places. So I'm sure maybe you can include some information for us from your experience too. So, Yeah. <clears throat> there we go. Uh, so uh, there were no uh, cages. So the approach was uh, for an interbody fusion and uh, with bone graft material, uh, we 
used uh, iliac crest bone graft to try the uh, demineralized bone matrix that was not terribly satisfactory uh, by itself. And to supplement it, we uh, did uh, trans facet screws percutaneously. So it was done prone. Uh, we went uh, not uh, extreme, we called it extreme lateral, but it wasn't 90 degrees. It was uh, on average about 70, 75 degrees. It's trans psoas. Uh, in the first two cases, we had transient uh, uh, anterior thigh numbness. Uh, and we uh, changed uh, the trajectory a little bit, took it a little bit more lateral, and we didn't have any more uh, cases of those. Um, the original uh, system was purely dilators. Uh, and uh, I uh, stopped using that system when the engineers start dilators um, and didn't let me know, you know, having done the first case for them, I was a little disappointed that they decided to make changes without even asking. So we, we had a case uh, where we had uh, uh, motor weakness uh, and it, it was fortunately transient, uh, but when I was doing this serial dilating, uh, they had decided in the upper numbers, rather than going sequentially a millimeter at a time, they decided to uh, skip some millimeters. So we went from you know, 10 to 12 to 15 uh, and you know, kind of got me a little bit upset. So I moved away from that um, and I didn't go back to uh, extreme lateral until uh, number of years later when we had the uh, retractor, the expandable retractor uh, with the system that you showed, uh, uh, doing a re uh, totally retroperitoneal approach, uh, 90 degrees. Uh, I did jack the table uh, almost all of the time. Um, and, uh, and one of the upper ones, we did uh, need to do a rib resection. And back when I trained, uh, when you had a couple of years of general surgery, I didn't bother asking a thoracic surgeon to remove part of the 12th rib. It's, it's really extra thoracic and it was just another piece of bone in the way. Um, and if you're doing that, it makes nice bone graft. Um, so overall, it's, uh, it's a very good technique. It was started initially for uh, mechanical uh, discogenic pain rather than decompression, because we didn't have any way to expand the space. Uh, and, and I think the ability to uh, do uh, foraminal decompression with this with the cages uh, is, is quite satisfactory. Uh, but in the right patients here, it's, it's all uh, patient selection uh, that does this. Uh, when we were originally doing the uh, facet screws, uh, that works pretty well as an adjunct uh, for a, a cage. Um, and uh, with the Nuvasiv uh, cages, they have the side plate that you can attach to the cage with the, with the screws that you showed. Um, we didn't have any problem with breakage, but one of the things you have to be mindful of with those screws is the x-ray that you showed is the screws were parallel uh, to the end plate and parallel to the cage. Um, and that's where you get into trouble. Uh, screws should diverge. Uh, aim on the upper one up and out and the lower one down and out. Uh, and that will help you avoid the stresses on the end plate that can lead to that kind of fracture. Uh, but in uh, if you're concerned about that, then supplementing with uh, the set fixation uh, rather than uh, it's much easier to do than uh, pedicle screws, especially if you've got the patient in the lateral position. Originally, we had uh, quite an elaborate guidance system for those, uh, and it would take us uh, an additional 40 minutes to put in a couple of facet screws. Uh, and I, after the third third case, I abandoned that and just freehanded it uh, using the fluoroscope. Uh, and then you can do it in like 10 minutes, uh, and it makes a good supplement. So overall, it's a good approach. I think it's underutilized. Uh, and uh, rather than stretching the size of the cages, you want to stretch the envelope, we ought to stretch the envelope for the indications for it. 
a, lot, a lot of patients who have uh, cortication or symptoms of um, uh, compression do get significant enough relief with this approach to avoid doing a two, three level massive decompression and instrument infusion. Um, so uh, obviously I'm no longer doing surgery, but uh, you know, uh, I found that to be a very worthwhile approach and uh, I'd like to see it used uh, more often. I'll bring that book in. I can, do we still have a library up uh, in the office? Um. Okay, uh, I'll bring it in next week and uh, leave it in the call room. Matt, I got a question. I don't know if anyone's speaking right now. Nope, all you. Yeah, uh, sorry if I I, uh, I missed it, but is uh, what patient factors are contraindications? And my my main one was um, body habitus. Is that um, a contraindication? I obviously haven't done a lot of them, so I'm not as aware. Um, I think. I don't think necessarily, um, cause a lot of times, I mean, a lot of the habitus usually tends to be like anterior central adiposity going through, I mean, unless they got some huge love handles. Um, um, Dr. Malberg, have you done any on? Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's uncomfortable, but it's not a contraindication. You're just going to be deeper, darker hole. I think like most of our cases end up being. Okay, thanks. Yeah, most of well for uh, for males with a large, uh, big BMI, it's usually anterior panis, and it falls aside. It, it was one case we even taped it out of the way. Um, uh, females are a little more evenly distributed. Uh, but on the other hand, it's, uh, it's easier to do dissection. Uh, this, the tissues are just not as resilient. Um, so it, it's, uh, the instruments are long enough. Uh, I, I never had to turn a patient down because of size. Although I, after halfway through the case, I wish I had, but. Any other questions? Good. I guess I guess I got another question. So, how? Okay. What do you? My big concern would be uh, a viscous injury, renal injury. Um, yes. How, I guess just because we're not in that world much anymore. How are you monitoring for that? Someone has a lot of pain post op. Uh, what are you looking for? So, the things I've seen as far as actually i don't in here so they actually list the percentages in this study pretty well so they had three out of how many patients three out of 1795 in the pre as pre so as and three out of the 2300 so it's it's very 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 low risk um and then there was one case of a ureter injury anterior to so as zero with the trans so as um Usually what I've seen is it's not usually caught intra-op, it's usually caught post-op. And these patients, from what I've read, tend to have some sort of abdominal pain, acute abdominal pain, and acute abdomen or something like that. And then generally, these patients are getting a CT of the abdomen and pelvis, and then finding out that maybe there was some sort of bowel injury from there. If that happens, then obviously general surgery gets involved and takes it from there. But from what I've seen, you usually don't recognize something like a bowel injury um, intraoperatively. It's usually a post-op finding. I don't know if you've... Yeah, uh, actually, it's uh, <clears throat> in uh, the couple of cases we had where the uh, perineum is you know, very thin uh, and you we actually could see some bowels starting to uh, herniate into the operative field uh, and you, know, you have to use a low retractor or a, uh, retractor to keep it out of the way uh, 
there was never any uh, deficit afterward. Uh, I think there were three cases where I had to keep retracting the bowel, but <clears throat> you really should be able to recognize that. And I think the fact that uh, our training in orthopedics now uh, limits our exposure to general surgery so much that uh, it's hard to distinguish just uh, peritoneal uh, bulging from an actual loop of bowel. So it's, you know, you should be able to see it uh, and you can retract it. It, it really makes, uh, makes the case a lot tougher because you have to, another pair of hands because you need to have someone <clears throat> keep the bowel out of the way, but uh, it can happen. One more uh, quick uh, point about subsidence and uh, subsidence is usually, if it's not the result of uh, osteoporosis, uh, it's almost always uh, uh, having a cage that's a little too small, sits on the, uh, doesn't sit on the cortical uh, portion of the end plate. Uh, and, uh, and there's not quite enough. There was an old, old study when, um, Casey Lee, who was a uh, very good spine surgeon, was up in Newark. He was uh, chief of that program there for a while. And he was uh, a big proponent of the uh, uh, PLIFs. And he actually had done a study on the uh, uh, area that you need for to prevent subsidence of the bone graft uh, on an end plate. And it was, uh, I think it was like 2.4 square uh, centimeters uh, that you needed as a minimum. If you had less than that, you'd always get uh, subsidence. And so if you place the cage, uh, the footprint of the cage is important. Uh, and it's hard through an X lift and an A lift. Uh, and particularly, and with the T lift, as you know, the cages are pretty small. And so the footprint is, uh, it is not enough to prevent subsidence by itself. So you have to supplement it uh, with posterior fixation. It's one of the reasons I'm not a very big fan of the T-lift. Uh, the footprint isn't good enough and the angle uh, that you, you're putting in, where you're, you're not preventing uh, flexion and you uh, anterior posterior and you're not preventing lateral flexion. Uh, it's, it's biomechanically uh, the wrong angle. Uh, to put it in and you can't get a big enough footprint. So that's uh, so why I'm much more fond of the X-Lift than a T-Lift. Hey, Matt, very well done. Thank you, everyone.